of Nebraska. I think right the center of Nebraska, that's where I live. Uh, the town is Broken Bow. I've been here 22 years and Custer County is kind of goes back and forth being the second or third highest cow-calf county in the United States. We have about 100,000 cows and ca cows, it, mother cows here in Custer County. And I grew up on a ranch in the sand hills of Nebraska. So for those of you that are joining us from out of state, the sand hills are in the north central part of Nebraska. It's 19,000 square miles of grass stabilized sand dunes. And we have wet meadows and upland pastures is, is essentially what we have. And a lot of the photos that you'll see tonight are from the sand hills of Nebraska. But with that, I will go ahead and get started. We'll talk about cow nutrition needs at calving and in early lactation. And picture here is of, of our ranch out in Arthur County, just kind of give you an idea of how I'll be talking tonight and referring to. But when we think about feeding our mother cows, late lactation or early lactation, late gestation, there's some things that we really need to consider. We need to consider that beef cow or heifer, if it's a first calf heifer, second calf heifer, their nutritional requirements. So we need to be thinking about that. And we also need to know those periods of high and low nutritional demands that that cow has. Know those stress periods that can result in nutrient deficiencies in that animal. Maybe we need to supplement any of these nutritional shortages, but we also need to realize that we can't always afford to probably meet our cow's nutrient requirements. Then we have your ranch or farm's resources. They're specific to your operation. And know your ranch, know any advantages you have, know any shortcomings you have, and try to utilize forage as much as you can on your ranch. Also think about the body condition of your cows. Monitor your cow's condition and see what direction their body condition is moving. Are they gaining condition? Are they losing condition? Are they maintaining? that can help you with your nutritional program. And then think about the cow effects of your management, how you're managing your, your land, your pastures, your forages, your genetics, you are having effects on that cow. Know what those effects of your management are. And then also know how the effects of that dam affect that calf that you are essentially influenced by your management. So these are the considerations you need to think about for your cow herd when you think about meeting her nutritional demands. So the nutrition during the late gestation, so that would typically be the last 60 to 90 days of gestation, plays a very large role on the future of that calf you're producing as well as that dam. So in that last 60 to 90 days or that pre-calving time or that third trimester, if you want to call it that, it's going to impact that calf survivability, its long-term health, and his overall or her overall production in your herd. And also how you manage those cows and feed those cows during, during this time is going to affect her future breeding and her reproductive performance. And it's also important to note that during this time, these last three months of gestation, 70% of that fetal growth occurs. So there's a lot of nutrient requirements going to that fetal growth. And other than mid gestation, right after weaning, this is the second best time you have to add weight to any thin cows that you have in your herd and increase that body condition score prior to calving. So here we have the net energy requirements for a 1200 pound March 1st calving cow with 25 pounds of peak milk production. So you can see on the y-axis on the side there, it's net energy megacals per day. So don't get too hung up on this. I just want you to realize the amount of energy and how it changes over that cow's production cycle that you need. So across the y-axis, we have the month since calving, one month clear through 12 months, of course. So if we look at this, hopefully you can see my pointer here. We have that calf being born and then 60 days after calving, that's when that cow has her highest energy requirements. That is also when she is producing the most amount of milk. That's her peak lactation time. So 60 days after calving. 
And also important to note right here is that this peak milk production coincides with the beginning of the breeding season. So that cow calved, and now she's producing milk, highest peak milk production in her cycle here. And she's also recovering from calving and she's getting ready for breeding. So we're, we're asking quite a bit of this cow. And if we have her going into this thin, we're going to have trouble with getting her rebred in a timely manner because we want to have a calf every 365 days. So when we're clear over here on the left, when she's at peak milk production, you can probably think she needs 15 to 16 pounds of TDN a day. And then when we get over here late gestation, it's down to a nine to probably 11 pounds of TDN. So we've had our peak milk production going through this production cycle. Then you see at month seven here, we're going to wean that calf. We're going to remove lactation from that cow. And you can see that's the point that her net energy requirements are the lowest. Then as we get to that last 60 to 90 days, that fetus is growing and her nutrient requirements are increasing there. So this has kind of helped me think through this a little bit. And this is from a UNL publication, Body Condition Scoring Beef Cows. But what we're looking at are the energy requirements of a beef cow. She's 1170 pounds, five-year-old mature cow. But the net energy she needs in her production cycle, she needs energy for maintenance. And if this was a young female, first calf, second calf heifer still growing, there would be energy required for growth. This animal needs energy for lactation and pregnancy. So as we look at this, she mar calved the 1st of March. So she has that maintenance requirement. She has her lactation requirement. You can see that lactation requirement is highest 60 days after calving. And then when we finally get that cow bred, we're starting on this pregnancy requirement. But then you can see about September here, we wean that calf, we remove that lactation requirement. So if we look at the total requirements that this cow needs, we can see the time to put that weight on them is right after weaning. And it's also good to note here that those last three months, that requirement for pregnancy in that fetus is really growing. So I kind of like to look at it this way. It kind of helps me visualize this a little better. So we need to set some goals for that winter feeding time frame or pre-calving, we can call it. And I like to think, set your goals with the end in mind. And what I mean by that is maybe set the body condition or the condition you want your cows to be in at calving. And from wherever you're at, work towards that goal so you can have that certain body condition score when those cows calve. And body condition scoring is a based on a nine point scale from one being really thin to nine being really fat. And one body condition score equals about, equates to about 75 pounds. And the benefit of body condition scoring is it's free. You can do it every time you look at your cows and it can be a tool that you use in the overall production of your herd. And hopefully, as I mentioned a few things tonight, you'll see how it can be beneficial for you. But Body condition score essentially evaluates the energy reserves in the form of fat that we see on our beef cows. And that beef cow can store energy, like I said, in the form of fat. And she increases in fat when her energy intake exceeds her requirements. And then she can draw on these energy reserves when she needs to, to meet her requirements if she gets in a time, say a, a, an extended cold period or something where she's not getting enough energy from her ration. So body fat also insulates the cow from cold weather. So that's important to remember also. And when body condition scoring, I just like to remind people to take into account muscle and hair coat. When cattle have a winter hair coat, that hair coat's long, that can be deceiving. Those cows, you might think they're looking fatter than they actually really are. And you also have to consider the stage of pregnancy that cow is in, any room and fill, Last time those cows took a drink, sometimes they take a big drink and look really full. Also, when it's cold out, they'll appear skinnier than they are. And also if they've been shrunk, they'll look skinny. So I always like people to remind people to think of those things. So when we body condition score, there's several key areas that we evaluate. And we'll just start at the back here. 
at the tail head, look for fat around each side of that, then around the pins and then the hooks and across the back and across the ribs and then into the brisket. So let's look at what we'd call borderline. This animal is a body condition score of four. Remember the scale is from one to nine. Kind of have a rear view here and a side view. But as we look from the rear view, we can see we don't really have much fat right around the tail head back here. And as we look at these ribs here on the side, we can see that 12th and 13th rib. And if we would feel that cow across the back, we could feel her backbone on there too. So that's a body condition score of four. You can see there's some muscle loss in the hind quarter here too. So let's move to a body condition score of five. And I'll talk about body condition score of five quite a bit tonight because we want our mature cows to be in a body condition score of five at calving. And as we look at this cow, we can start to see that the areas on each side of the tail head is starting to fill in. Really can't see the ribs anymore. We felt on her backbone, it'd take quite a bit of pressure to feel that backbone. So this is body condition score of five. So then let's look at a body condition score of six. We're starting to actually see a little bit of fat in the brisket here. Uh, ribs are pretty much fully covered, getting really full on the sides of that tail head there too. So that's a body condition score of six. So just when you monitor your cows, I just encourage you to body condition score your cows. So then the next question is, well, when is a good time to body condition score? Like I said, anytime you're looking at your cows, always be monitoring their nutritional status with your eyes, and that can, that can help you with their management. But here in Nebraska, with spring calving cows, late summer is really a good time to start looking at body condition of your cows, and especially your younger females, first calf heifers, second calf heifers. And if we start seeing we're losing body condition on those younger females, this would maybe be a good time to early wean if you have that ability. And then you can start really putting some weight on those younger females. So here we are at weaning. These cows have just been weaned. So weaning is another really good time to body condition score your animals. So we're body condition scoring these animals. If they're less than a five or more than five, you make that decision on your animals, your cattle. And if they're less than a five and you think you need to be putting some weight on them, now is really a good time to be doing this. It's a very economical time. Their nutrient requirements are the lowest. It's going to be the cheapest for you to put weight on these animals, body condition. And probably you're going to need to supplement protein and energy at this time, unless you're going to turn them out on some regrowth on meadow or you have some lush forage of some annual that you've planted at this time, wherever you're at in the country, but this is a good time to be putting weight on them. And if you have a body condition score that's five or greater and you just kind of need to maintain those animals up through calving, probably just maybe need to be thinking about supplementing some protein if they're out grazing some lower quality forage. And like again, depending what you're going to have them graze on, if it's high in protein and energy, you're probably okay without supplementing anything. But weaning is that time for you to start making some decisions so you do not get behind on keeping your cattle's condition where you want them. I'll also, I might mention, of course, with our younger females that are still growing, they have a higher nutrient requirement. But we like to see them be at a body condition score of six at calving for those first calf heifers and a body condition score of five and a half for those second calf heifers. heifers and a body condition score of five for our mature cows. So here's some research that came out of Purdue and it shows the relationship between body condition and the average interval from calving to that first heat after calving or that postpartum interval. So we can see that the lower the body condition score of those animals are when they calve, that average postpartum interval is longer until their first heat or X or estrus. So if those cows are in a body condition score of four, it's going to take them 70 days for that first estrus or heat cycle. And if their body condition score of five, it'll take them 59 days. So remember how I said there's cow effects to your management. So if you're managing your cows to be skinny at calving, 
it's probably going to take them longer to get rebrand. So just kind of keep that in mind as a cow effect. So here's some more research that they that Hoop Houghton did at Purdue, but he found that thin cows that are gaining body condition increase the probability of cows becoming pregnant. So if we look at that first line, those cows that were thin under a body condition score of five and were on an increasing plane of nutrition by the time breeding was there. So for example, would be if you turned out on green grass the first of May and you didn't turn the bulls in until the first of June, those cows would be eating that lush forage and be on an increasing plane of nutrition. And you can see the pregnancy rate is higher. And if they had a fleshy cow that body condition score greater than five and increasing their body condition score, if they still had decent pregnancy rate, but not as good. But if you have a thin cow and they're on a decreasing plane of nutrition, that pregnancy rate is low. So I guess the research just shows when we have animals on an increasing plane of nutrition, we're going to have a better chance of getting them bred. So that's another cow effect we can deal with. Now let's talk about ranch resources. I, I think this is very important. And hopefully by the time I get done explaining, you'll realize why. But on your ranch or farm, you have certain forage resources. This is a sub-irrigated meadow here in Nebraska. But if you have a meadow or sub-irrigated meadow, or you have upland pasture, sub-irrigated pasture, maybe you have some farm ground where you plant some forage, could be a summer annual, it could be a spring grain or a winter grain, or you even could have some irrigated land where you have irrigated grass or you plant some type of forage for your cows. Those are your resources that you can use and utilize. So on your ranch, your resources are your forage resources, but then they also have the genetics of your animal. They are unique to your ranch. Then also you have the philosophy of you being a cattle manager or a ranch operator. That is different than any other ranch or operation anywhere. And that is your management. Then the fourth thing is your economic situation. Not everybody is in the same economic situation. And that, that's important. I mean, you have, maybe you're paying off your land. Maybe you have taxes. Of course you have taxes, but maybe your land is paid for. So you have to think about what you can afford to do. And the most important thing you have to think about is what you can't afford not to do. So let me say that again. Think about what you can't afford not to do. So hopefully some of the things I've talked about on feeding your cows at this point are some of those things that you realize that you can't afford not to do. And also I like to remind people to test your forage if you don't know what your forage tests, you really don't know what the nutrients are that your cows are consuming and it makes it hard to know if you're needing, meeting their needs or not. Body condition scoring can help you with that if you don't test your forage, but we always encourage you to test your forage. I also encourage people to store your hay in such a way that you minimize any loss, forage losses. Also feed your forage or hay in a way that minimizes losses, you can have up to over 30% loss on how you feed your hay. And that's an economic decision you have to make. Maybe it's something you can't afford to lose to understand crude protein, energy or TDN, total digestible nutrients. When you read your forage analysis, always look on the dry matter basis to get the values that you use for your rations for crude protein and total digestible nutrients or that energy. And then when you design your feeding program, match your forage with the nutrient needs of your cattle. So if you know a mature cow after weaning, late gestation does not need as high of, of quality forage or a protein energy dense forage as that young younger female needs. So feed your hay according to the nutrient needs of those cattle. Maybe you want to save some of that higher quality forage until after calving to feed to your first and second calf heifers. So that's all of your ranch resource considerations you need to think about. And then there are feeding considerations that we have to think about. We're going to probably have some protein supplementation at some point, maybe energy supplementation. So when we're supplementing protein, this is some 
A lot of research has shown this. We will see an increase in digestibility of low quality forage when we supplement a pound or two of protein. And here in Nebraska, when we graze winter range, our forage is less than 7% crude protein. And we can see by feeding a pound or two of a protein supplement, we can often get those mature cows through that late gestation up to calving without losing any body condition and just maintaining where we are at. Now, the other thing we have to think about with protein supplementation is the frequency of protein supplementation. And research has shown that we can supplement our protein daily, every other day, or once a week, and the animals will respond very similar. And of course, this helps save on some transportation costs. So if we're so for instance, if we're supplementing distiller's grains or cottonseed cake or alfalfa, we can determine the frequency. And of course, I just remind people that if you're feeding a week's supply of hay at one time, you're going to have some feeding losses there you have to account for. Then with energy supplementation, I just like to remind people we have starch-based, which would be our grains like corn or wheat if you're supplementing with wheat. Those are our starch-based energy supplements versus fiber-based energy supplements, which would be like distillers, grains, or wheat mints are examples of fiber-based. And when we do energy supplementation, we probably need to do that every day, especially on our starch base. Maybe we could get away with it every other day on our fiber base, but definitely with our starch base, we have to feed that every day. Then I also like to remind people that if you have some thin mature cows, you have some young cows and you have some fat mature cows, you need to sort those thin cows and those young cows away from those mature cows because those first calf heifers are not going to compete. Those younger cows just will not compete with those older cows near as well. And those thin mature cows, they need some extra body condition put on them before calving also. And if they're with the, and if you're feeding your mature cows to maintain their body condition score five and they're fat, you know, your thin cows probably aren't going to be gaining much weight on that. And also you don't want to feed the whole herd to the thinnest for the thinnest cow because then you're overfeeding all your other cattle and they're going to be fat. So that's costing you more money. And the other thing I'd like to remind people is that first calf heifers are going to decrease their daily dry matter intake by 17% in the three weeks prior to calving. And the reason for that is, is that fetus is growing in that young, smaller female. That fetus is displacing some of that rumen so that first calf heifer can just not, can't eat enough. So you need to be feeding her a more protein energy dense ration at that time. And then after calving, those first calf heifers need a diet that's 62% TDN and 11 to 12% crude protein. So when we have a cow that's thin at calving, it's very going to be very hard to pick her weight up after calving. But if we have a fat cow before calving, that fat cow can pretty much coast through the winter and maybe even lose a little weight before she grow, goes back to grass without any detrimental effects. So just be managing those cows. Next, we have to think about a supplement. And what you need to think about, what are the nutrient needs for your cows? And also, what is that nutrient content of the base diet? Are you feeding hay? Are you in a dry lot situation? Are you out grazing in a pasture? Are you out grazing on, on the meadow? Whatever you're doing, know what that base diet is, and then you can base your supplement off of that to meet that cow's requirements. Then from there, you need to think about the type of supplements you're going to use, the amount that you'll be supplementing, and then the price of that supplement. And when you're determining the type of supplements you'll use, it's going to be dependent upon your ranch. Maybe you have a caker, like in the picture here, you can feed cubes to your cattle. Maybe you have a feed wagon where you can do a mixed ration. Maybe you have some type of bale processor that you'll be using. It will depend upon the equipment that you have and the storage ability you have for those that supplement. And then when you price that supplement, price it on a cost per pound of whatever nutrient you're looking at, whether it's crude protein or cost per pound of energy, TDN, 
And then you also have to consider any feeding loss cost and also freight to get it there and any storage loss also. So that's how you think about your supplement. So in order to increase body condition, your ration must meet that nutrient requirements for that cow's maintenance and lactation or gestation, whatever you have going on at that stage of production, her minerals and vitamins, but it needs to exceed the requirement for any energy. And to increase that body condition, that energy must be fed in a dense enough form that the cow has the capacity cons to consume it on a daily basis, like I said. Now we have to think about the effects of weather. And energy needs for beef cattle increase about 1% for each degree below 32 degrees Fahrenheit in a dry cold. But then when we get into wet weather, the calculation is similar, except that starting temperature is at 59 degrees Fahrenheit and the energy increases 2% for each degree below 59 degrees. And then we have to consider wind effects too. So if they're cold and wet and then the wind is blowing, they're really going to be expending a lot of energy to generate heat to stay warm. And then if we have muddy conditions on top of that for an extended period of time, those cattle can lose, lose condition very quickly. So you need to think about maybe having some wind breaks or get cattle behind a hill or, a, or in a canyon or something if you have that ability. Cattle are very good at finding areas out of the wind. I'm always surprised to see cattle all bunched up behind just a, in a swale on a just kind of a cold breezy day. They can find a way to get out of the wind pretty easily. Now let's think about calf effects. And here's some research out of Colorado State. They took IgG, which is immunoglobulin G, which is the antibody found in colostrum. And they looked in the serum of calves when they were 24 hours old and they looked for this antibody. And you can see that the thinner that cow is, your body condition score two across the bottom to six and the amount of that antibody serum IgG that was found in the blood of that calf. You can see that the skinnier that cow is at calving, the lower the antibodies are in her colostrum. So if we're having thin cows at calving, we're going to affect that calf by having lower colostrum for that calf. So that's very important to think about. And also calves that are thin or in low body condition score at calving, they may give birth to calves that are less vigorous and slower to stand up and nurse for that first time. And also if we have a combination of poor forage quality and bad weather, that can lead to that cow getting thin and having weak calves. So there was some research here in Nebraska at the U.S. Meat Animal Research Center here at Clay Center, and they looked at calves antibodies in their blood serum at 24 hours old also, but they compared calves that had adequate passive immunity that they received from colostrum to calves that had inadequate levels of that passive immunity or that antibody, that IgG in their blood. And what they found was those calves that had inadequate levels of this antibody were 5.4 times greater, they had a greater risk of pre-weaning death. These calves also had a 6.4 times greater risk of sickness in the first 28 days of their life. They were also 3.2 times greater risk of sickness prior to weaning. They had a three times greater risk of being sick in the feedlot. And sickness in the first 28 days of their life was associated with a 35 pound lower expected weaning weight. So how we manage those cows before calving affects the colostrum quality, which affects the calves throughout their life, even into the feedlot. And they found that respiratory disease in the feedlot of these calves with inadequate levels of antibodies resulted in about a tenth of a pound lower average daily gain. So there are calf effects there also. So here's some compiled data, and this just came out in 2020 in the Nebraska Beef Cattle Report. And you can find that online if you're interested in learning more about this study. But if they compiled the data from four independent studies 
conducted over 13 years at the Goodmanson Sandhills Laboratory, which is the university's research ranch in the Sandhills in north central Nebraska. And what they looked at was supplementing that dam in late gestation. We look across the top here, they received that dam received no supplement, or they received one pound of the supplement or two pounds of the supplement. And the supplement was a 32% crude protein, 89% TDM supplement. And you can see, and this is the effect of that late gestation supplementation on the steer calves, on the steer progeny productivity. And I guess what's significant here is you look at that weaning weight from those cows that received no supplement, those cows that received one pound of supplement, their steer calves essentially weighed 10 pounds more at weaning than the no supplement, and the cows that received two pounds of supplement, their calves weighed 20 pounds more than those calves that received no supplement. So how you feed that cow does have a calf effect. So let's look at the same study and they looked at the heifer progeny. And I guess the significant part on this was from birth to wean, those heifers had a higher average daily gain when they were their dams were supplemented in the third trimester or late gestation. But if you wanna read all about this study, you can find that in the 2020 Nebraska Beef Cattle Report. So as I kind of finish up tonight, I thought I would just go over some rations for you because I've talked a lot about feeding cows here. So here's a maintenance ration for a 1,200 pound cow that's 250 days pregnant. So she's 30 days out from calving. So she's grazing winter range here in the sand hills. And from research the university has done, the crude protein of winter range at this time, 1st of February is 4.7% crude protein. TDN is 50.5% percent. And if we, they eat all they can, this is as fed, be about 29 pounds of winter range, and they're getting a supplement of two and a half pounds of dried distillers, grains, cube, and solubles. That is going to essentially be a maintenance diet for that cow. Or if you're more in central Nebraska, you have cane hay, sorghum sedan hay, alfalfa, and corn, and you're wanting to have a maintenance diet sorghum sedan, 50% TDN, seven and three quarters percent crude protein, full bloom alfalfa, 54% TDN, 16.79% crude protein. And so if we feed 15 pounds of that sorghum sedan hay, nine and a half pounds of alfalfa and four pounds of corn, we're going to have a maintenance ration for that 1200 pound cow, 250 days pregnant. So now let's look at a ration for a first calf heifer in peak lactation. You can see across the bottom, I pulled this out of a university publication on supplementation needs for gestating and the lactating beef cows. So you might be interested in reading that publication if you want some more information. But here's an example ration for that first calf heifer in peak lactation. So remember, she is still growing. She needs a higher quality diet than what our mature cow needs. And feeding out grazing winter range at this time this would be, we're probably looking April, first part of May, sometime in there. 8% crude protein, 50% TDN, feeding them some medium quality hay, 12% protein, 56% TDN, and feeding dried distillers grains. You can see on an as fed basis, 12 and a half pounds of their out grazing, feeding them 12 and a half pounds of hay and four and a half pounds of dried distillers grains for a maintenance diet. Remember, I said they need a diet that's 62% TDN and uh, probably 11 to 12% crude protein to meet those requirements. And a lot of times as, as you price supplements, a lot of times you're going to find that alfalfa is a fairly cheap protein source for you to be using. So if we look at another ration for a mature 1200 pound cow in peak lactation being fed some of that medium quality hay like we had before, 8% crude protein and dried distillers grains. She, all she's going to be able to eat on an as fed basis about 28 pounds of that hay and being fed five pounds of distillers grains and that would be a maintenance diet at peak lactation. Uh, I looked at another diet that guys in central Nebraska might use and, I, and to meet their requirements at this point, you use 40 pounds of corn silage and 
about 12 pounds of sorghum sedan or cane hay and five pounds of alfalfa hay, and that would that would be meeting their requirements too. And a lot of times on the rations when they're in peak lactation, if you're feeding a lot of energy, they're going to use that to produce milk rather than put fat on that cow. So that's that's another reason why it's good to have that cow fat before she calves. We also get the question of grass tetany. So I just thought I'd mention it a moment here. So what grass tetany is, is low blood magnesium in that cow. Sometimes people call it milk staggers, but it's caused by a mineral imbalance. And if we have high potassium or nitrogen or low calcium in the diet, that can give us grass tetany also. But we see it in older heavy milking cows when we turn them out onto lush green forage in the spring. And it's usually here in Nebraska on cool season pastures or some small grain or winter annual that's really green and lush. But to prevent this, we need to start supplementing magnesium at least 30 to 45 days ahead of that period when we're going to be turning those cattle out onto that lush forage. And if you feed three to four ounces of a high mag mineral, which is usually 10 to 13 percent magnesium, you're going to prevent that grass tetany in those cattle. Also wanted to mention fall calving here in Nebraska. Fall calving usually starts in August, sometime first to mid-August. But you can see cows, her lowest nutrient needs are right before calving and she's been on green grass all summer long, as long as we're not in a drought. You can see she can be in really good condition. You can see this, this cow is in really good condition. The, we know, as we talked about, research has indicated that cows breed back best on an increasing plane of nutrition. And fall calving cows are going to likely be bred back in November. And of course, here in Nebraska, forage starts to dry up mid-August to the 1st of September for our warm season grasses. So unless you're grazing cool season annuals such as oats or triticale or brassicas such as turnips or radishes, it's not likely that those cows are going to be on an increasing plane of nutrition and breeding. <clears throat> Excuse me. And if the forage quality was poor at calving, the cows could be thin below that body condition score of five, which could ne negatively impact your pregnancy rates. So this might be a time if you're having some low preg rates on your fall calving cows that you would maybe want to be supplementing these cows a little bit and get them on an increasing plane of nutrition. Also, this was a, a Beef Watch webinar, but for those of you that have not subscribed to the Beef Watch e newsletter that we mail out the first of every month, the web address where you can go to this page is across the top there at beef.unl.edu slash beefwatch. And then you can see you can come over here and subscribe. And like I said, this is mailed out at seven o'clock the first day of every month. And there's usually six to nine articles from Nebraska specialists or educators on beef related topics that are in Beef Watch. And you can also get into the Nebraska Beef Watch archive and we have 810 archived articles. So pretty much anything about beef you can find in our Beef Watch archive. So I encourage you to sign up if you have not signed up yet.